What's up, YouTube subscribers? And for the ones watching right now who haven't subscribed yet, why don't you go ahead and check out my channel, watch some of the videos, like the ones you like there, and if you want to stay up to date with everything I'm doing on my 66 C10, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. So, I did not expect to be making a video like this, but since I am, I'm going to go ahead and do a couple other things and show you all a few things as well. But I've been having issues with the carburetor that is currently on the engine right now. It is a Edelbrock 600 CFM 1405, which is the manual choke. Recently, when I went to C10s in the park, I went ahead and changed oil the day before. Went out there, had a good time, did a couple other things with the truck. And just, just out of routine maintenance or just just kind of checking things over. I checked the oil level and I noticed it reeked of fuel. And it looked like it might have grew just a little bit, which is hot because you don't want your oil level to grow. That's not a good thing. So I immediately pulled the carburetor off. And sure enough, it's got a dual plane Edelbrock intake and that divider wall, the driver's side portion of the intake, which feeds the 135 and seven cylinders, was soaking wet. The passenger side was dry. So I took the carburetor apart, looked at it, really couldn't see anything wrong with it. I checked the floats, make sure they were great. Gaskets looked fine. I went ahead and swapped needle and seats because maybe they're, you know, leaking or whatever. Bare fried fuel pressure at the pump, which I had set at 5 PSI. Put it all back together. Ran it cold, just basically set the carburetor on the engine. Hooked it up, turned the fuel pump on, let it run for 10 minutes. Could not see any fuel leaking anywhere. So connected it, ran the engine, got it warmed up. While it was running, took the flashlight, looked down the barrels, could not see any reason why this thing's doing what it's doing. Shut it off, pull the carburetor off, same situation. I do not know what's going on, but it's ruining my oil. I gotta change the oil again, and that's frustrating because it's like $8 a quart for this oil that I run plus filter. Today, we're gonna to be taking that carburetor off. It's just sitting on the intake right now, and we're gonna set it side by side and compare it to the new Edelbrock carburetor that I got here on the workbench. I also, as an added bonus, I'm gonna show y'all that I've never filmed or even uh, ever explained how I did the PCB system on this truck. If you've been a subscriber for a while, you probably are aware that this is not the engine that came in the truck. I did an engine swap back in 2019, took out the original numbers matching 283 over here on the stand. You can kind of see the valve cover there and put that thing in it. I bought this engine about 10 or 11 years ago from a friend who's doing a LS swap on a, on a square body. And basically I got a complete turnkey motor, ignition system, headers, accessories, including that alternator right there and the carburetor so that carburetor is about 10 maybe 11 years old i've put a couple of kits on it i've done a bunch of a bunch of tuning upgrades to make it run as good as i can and with that thing leaking like that and not really knowing why it's leaking i even called edelbrock tech support explained in detail everything i'm dealing with and they said the only thing they can think of is it might be a, just a gasket could be just replace the gaskets or put another rebuild kit in it and I thought about that. It's like, man, those rebuild kits are $55. If I just put another $55 in that carburetor and it doesn't, it's doing the same thing, that's a waste of money to me. So instead of doing that, I spent $400 on a brand new carburetor. So without further delay, I'm gonna go ahead and 180 the camera and I'm gonna show you the new carburetor and I'm gonna compare and show you the difference between this one and the new one. What, what? you painting? Nothing. Nothing? Why are, you, why are you making that video of me? Because you're pretty and I want everybody to see you. All right, I'll leave you alone. All right, so there's the carburetors. One on the left is obviously the new one. And there's the one we pulled off. At first glance, they're really and truly, they both look the same, except for the badge up front. Hardware's the same, gold, both manual choke. This one's a 600 CFM and this one's a 650. This is the new AVS-2, which if you don't know, AVS stands for Aero Valve Secondary, which is what this flat door is here. And this door is adjustable. All you have to do is basically loosen that gold screw right there, and you can adjust the tension with that flathead screw. You can adjust the tension on the spring 
to open or close or to open this flap sooner or later depending upon your engine's needs. The old performer style carburetors have the counterweighted flap here and that's non-adjustable. It's really not, not much you can do about that. The biggest thing I think is why I wanted to go to this carburetor is I've heard so many good reviews with it and it's because of the boosters that they put in here. These are the annular boosters and if you see those small little holes right there basically what that does it sends sprays an atomized spray of fuel almost like a, a shower head kind of sort of thing very fine spray patterns where the down leg booster is more of a straight shot like a water faucet in your kitchen sink so those are the two big differences between these two carburetors one of the main reasons why i went with this is mainly cost edelbrock's a good carburetor this one's been a good carburetor up until recently so that's why I went with this one. It's gonna bolt right up. I don't have to change anything. I just gotta put my fittings on and this thing will bolt right up. If I went to a Holly, I would have to change up everything and that would be more time consuming and frustrating on my end. Besides, this is a, a low horsepower engine. If it makes 300 horsepower, it's on a good day. It's just basically a mildly modified engine. I mean, it's still got stock manifold and um, it's got a mild cam, double hump heads. It's not really anything that's just crazy. So these carburetors are good for those type of engines, mild, mildly modified stock engines, somewhere around that area. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and take the top off of this carburetor because I wanna make sure everything looks good inside, clean, make sure the floats are set accurately, and then we'll go ahead and, and throw this carburetor on. And while we got the top apart, you can get a better visual of those annular boosters. See all, see those little circles? They go all the way around that red circle. And what that does is give you a better atomized air fuel mixture. And I've actually heard that these things perform almost like fuel injection. Now that's based on reviews. I have not ran one of these. I haven't run this yet, so I have no idea what this is gonna do. Let me go ahead and put all this back together, get my fuel fitting and rear barb fitting in the back of the carburetor. And then we're gonna go ahead and bolt it on the engine. All right, so the new carburetor fell into place. Everything connected perfectly. No issues there. That's just one, one of the main reasons why I went with Edelbrock to begin with. The second part of this video I wanted to explain is why I'm doing a dual PCV system. Never seen it done, at least the way I'm doing it, on I couldn't find anything on the interwebs, couldn't find anything on YouTube of anybody doing a, a dual PCV system like I'm doing. So let me go ahead and give you the rundown real quick. When I did this engine swap, this is a 350, one piece remain sealed, so it's a later model block, but I wanted to kind of go with that old school look. That's why I found these valve covers on Craigslist. They were unmolested, which was perfect. And what I did originally when I did the engine swap is I put a PCV valve and inside the valve cover, there's a baffle you'll see some screws back there. And I just ran a hose to the back of the carburetor. Normally that fitting is used for power brakes, but since I don't have that, that worked out per perfectly. But here recently I've noticed I had condensation. I pulled this valve cover off for whatever reason. And I noticed I had a bunch of condensation on this side, pull this one off, nothing. So I cleaned that mess up best I could, and I decided why not run a second PCV system. Had this port, it's not being used, so what I decided to do is go ahead and pre-bend some 3 8 hard line like you see here. And after a couple of tries, I nailed the bends perfectly. Look how perpendicular it is to the valve cover there. That worked out really nice. And I decided I was gonna paint it black, but I decided to keep it that natural silver finish because it kind of gives it more of a factory look and it was easier to just do it that way so i have to address a valve cover leak not going to bore y'all with that but what i am going to do is pull this valve cover off and i will show you exactly how i did the pcv valve on this particular valve cover so let me get this let me get this one off get on the workbench and show y'all how i did the pcv valve because it's going to be identical on both sides all right so there's the uh driver's side valve cover as you can tell, I got to replace this gasket. It's really wet right in the back here. Plus, I can feel it's kind of getting uh, brittle there. It's starting to get hard. 
So I got a new set I got to put on here in a minute, but I'm not going to bore you all with that. But there it is. That's the uh, baffle that I'm using. I believe it's made by Moroso. Got it at Summit Racing. I think it was like 7 or $8. I don't remember. It's under $10, that's for sure. It's just a pre-bent piece of aluminum. Comes with the hardware. Locking, they are locking nuts. Nylon locking nuts. So they should not fall out. And in there, and if you're brave enough to do so, all you got to do is make, I believe that's a one and an eighth inch hole. But you can make the hole as big as you need, depending upon the diameter of the actual grommet you're going to be using. Um, this one came off a Edelbrock valve cover, one of those stamp steel that, that they have. But on the other side, I use this grommet, and I like this one better because the PCV valve fits a lot more snug in the hole versus this one. So I'm going to be putting this one on. But that's pretty much it. That's how I did it on both sides. So the carburetor's installed. I went ahead and ran it. I've already made sure everything was good to go. Went ahead and set the uh, idle mixture screws as good as I could based with using a vacuum gauge. All right, let's go test drive this thing and see how it does. <clears throat> yep, your eyes ain't deceiving you guys. Intake manifold's off. Why is the intake manifold off, Charlie? Well, let me tell you. To make a long story short, the intake gaskets failed on this engine. And I never really realized it until three oil changes later. So I've had 15 quarts of oil, the good high zinc oil that costs about eight to $10 a quart. We've had about 15 of those through here. And the five that are in it now need to be dumped as well because it's probably grown about a half a quart with just pure gas. Three filters. This engine is probably compromised with all the gas that's went, ran through it. Problem is right now I don't want to pull it out and rebuild it. One, we're about to get into Christmas. Two, I really don't have the money or, or I have the time. I can make the time for it. I just don't have the money right now to be doing this. And I really don't want to do it because I got other videos I want to bring y'all. I got some exhaust manifolds I want to update, electric fans. I still got to do cruise control. I still haven't got to that thing yet. So I got a lot of things I want to be doing in this this truck, and it isn't pulling out engines to do re -ring, uh, to do a re ring and, and replace the bearings and all that other stuff. But I need to plan for that in the future because I want to take this engine out. So you might be asking, well, what happened? How did you figure out those intake gaskets? Well. When the new carburetors are leaking the exact same way the old one is, and after I exhausted fuel pressure, checking fuel pressure with a different gauge, lowering it, checking the uh, needle and seeds, make sure there ain't no trash in it, basically repeating myself on the old carburetor, I knew at that point it wasn't a carburetor issue and it's something going on that I'm unaware of. Let's pull the intake off, bam. Pull the intake off, both, one, two, both intake gaskets were completely saturated in fuel. I got them over there on the uh, workbench. They were soaked. I have not wiped them down, but they just, they've dried out, just evaporating. But what I'm going to do, the GoPro I'm using right now doesn't get really up close in detail. So I'm going to use my iPhone for, for that uh, video part. And I'm going to show you how the gaskets failed, where they failed. And I'm going to find, I'm going to tell y'all a little bit of information I found on the old Google webs about the gaskets I'm running or was running. Got a new set of gaskets for it that are different, same brand, but they're different. So we're gonna run those and I'll show you all that. So what I'm gonna do is take all the lifters out, check them, clean them up since they're flat tap. I wanna make sure I get all that fuely oil off of it. I wanna soak them in some fresh clean oil, put them back together, clean this up as best I can without taking the engine out. Obviously drain the oil put a new filter and it will get the intake back on it and we'll see how it runs. I mean, I'll look at the spark plugs. I got all eight of them out. No signs of fuel. They don't smell like fuel. They got a nice brownish tan color. So they're not running rich. They're not running lean. I mean, there was no indication that the intake gaskets to me have failed, but they did. The visual eye, I put my two chicken eyes on it and those, those gaskets have failed. And they failed badly. So let me grab my iPhone and move over to the workbench. I got the gaskets laid out. I'll show you the new ones. I'll show you the intake and all that stuff and show you what I discovered. 
Sometimes you just got to call out to them. And for myself, in doing so, this is what I discovered. These gaskets are made by Felpro, part number 1204. These are going to have the stock port size and the exhaust crossover, which this intake has, and the uh, double hump heads have right there. I got these because I had the exhaust crossover plate already in them to block it off. But what I found out on the old Google webs is these gaskets should not be used with an aluminum intake manifold. I don't know why, and trust me, if I'd have known that, I would never have put these gaskets on when I built this engine three years ago. But I did not know that, and it is what it is. But as you can tell right here, at that camera, oh, look at that. Look at that corner right there. Look how that failed. And you can kind of see it's like, low there and it kind of raises up and it gets low in the corner it's for some odd reason the corners is what flat spotted and failed same thing over here and then that gasket no different same issue that was a little bit more flat across the across the whole bottom there that was probably the worst i mean you can't even see the the line of it anymore and even this portion here it should seal off there, this runner inside the intake was completely full of oil. So, yeah, these gaskets, I believe, I, now that after having this engine for three years put together with these gaskets, I believe that these are not supposed to be used with aluminum intake manifolds. They must be used with cast iron only because I've never seen the intake gasket do this, and they should last a long time. Assuming the install and the intake and everything fits correctly, they should last a long time, a whole lot longer than these did. So, the correct gasket for me to use is Felpro, part number 1256. Obviously, you can tell this is a different material, some kind of fiber material, but it has what they call a Prento seal all the way around the runners and the uh, coolant passages. Downside, or maybe not a downside, is the exhaust crossover block off plate has a small hole in it so it will allow exhaust to go through here i did a little search on that to see if that's something i really need to block off and a lot of people were saying that if you got a daily driver stock build mildly modified cruiser style engine which is what i have is basically just a cruiser that this can help with fuel mileage it's going to heat up the plenum so it's going to atomize the air fuel mixture better because of the heat you're going to have better warm-ups in colder climates however the downside is you're going to have you're going to have their intake plenum is going to be a lot hotter on those hot start hot days summer days and stuff so you could have some percolation issues some um hot hard hot hot starts however you want to say that so the best thing to do to compensate for that is run some type of spacer. That's a one inch spacer I just recently bought. I'm gonna try that one. They make, I got a wood spacer over there. And I also, this is the one I was running recently. That's like three eighths thick or something like that. You just need to try to separate the carburetor from the intake manifold to get, the, to get it away from the heat. And hopefully this won't be an issue. Now, if you're building some high horsepower then try to find some way to block it off. And a lot of times, you, if you are running a high horsepower engine, you're, the, it probably won't have crossovers, or exhaust crossovers in the cylinder head. So, mug time again. So you see where I'm at. New gaskets, need to clean up the intake, get the engine prepped and ready to put everything back together. So I'm not gonna bore y'all with any of that. If I run into any, any issues, I'll go ahead and film it, show you what I'm dealing with, but Next time you see this, everything's going to be put back together, and this thing will be running, and we're going to get that carburetor retuned, and we'll go take it for a little test drive and see how everything's doing. Hopefully, 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 that engine's going to last me a little while longer. I can still run it like it is. These gaskets hold up and last for a long time or until I'm ready to tear into the engine. And then at that point, once I've got the money and the parts accumulated, then... We'll schedule time and we'll pull that engine out and get it rebuilt. But for now, I'm hoping everything's going to be okay and I can run it for a little while longer, enjoy it, go to a few shows, just whatever. And um, 
go from there. So I got a lot of work to do, as you can see here. So I'm going to get back to it. All right, she's back in the live. As you can tell, she's running. Got the new intake gaskets in. On initial startup, I set the timing. Then I started messing with the mixture screws on the carburetor. And I forgot when I leaned out the secondaries, I never put the factory jets back in it. Tried to shut everything off, put that back in. The way I put the factory jets back in it. And while I was at it, I went ahead and changed the squirter. The original one that comes in this carburetor is a 31. I put a 33 in it. And I put my stiffer accelerator pump. And along with that, I went ahead and changed the two step-up springs. To, they come with factory five inch springs, which is the orange ones. I want the eight inch plain ones. And I'll tell you why. Right now I'm pulling 15 inches of vacuum, pretty steady needle. Rule of thumb is, if you, whatever your vacuum rating is, divide that by two. So I'm pulling 15 inches of vacuum, that would be 7.5. I went ahead and rounded up and ran eight. I was running eight on the older carburetor I have over there and the transition from off idle to just normal driving as you stop at a light and go was a lot better with the 8 inch spring on the old carburetor so it should be the same way on this new one here now one thing I will say with the exhaust crossovers uh, now open on the intake I have noticed that the exhaust sounds a lot quieter and more mellow than it did before right. now what I may have to do is find me a video clip an older video clip of this thing running and maybe compare the two maybe y'all can hear it in the video but trust me she's a lot quieter than she was before so pretty much what I got left now is I want to check make sure I don't see no leaks make sure everything looks good and then once that is once I feel safe that these things ready to drive I'm going to pull the gauge off I need to put the air cleaner on it and then we'll take this thing for a little cruise all right guys let's get in this truck and take it for a drive just thought I'd show you my air filter setup so basically what I have here is an 11 inch bottom from k and set that on your carburetor an 11 inch by three, Canaan air filter. Fits perfectly inside the bottom there. And finally, the air cleaner top. This is the original air cleaner that came on the uh, 283 that I have. We're using the factory wing nut. All I did was clean this thing up and paint it and install a reproduction decal. This is the quickest, easiest way I know to reuse your factory style air cleaner, especially if you want to go for that factory look. You don't have to modify your base, especially if you don't have a welder or don't have the fabrication skills to do so. The only drawback would be it does raise your air cleaner up a little higher than it normally would set. But if you have like fuel lines, chokes, anything, distributors, more than likely you shouldn't have any issues with interference. So that is a plus on that. For you car guys that have 283, 327 with these style air cleaner, this may may not work for you, but it's worth a try. All right, let's close the hood, get this truck fired up, and take it for a little cruise. All right, guys, it's a beautiful Sunday morning. Nice cool breeze, sun's out. We'll take this. We're in this truck. We're taking it for a little cruise. I, I did. I have to say, I did drive this the other day. I just wanted to. Uh, make sure everything was good to go didn't have any gas going inside the oil my oil level did not grow so that's good no oil leaks i didn't see anything i didn't see any issues i needed to address so here we are now on this beautiful sunday morning we'll take it for a little cruise see what she does now first off i'll go ahead and say this right now just normal driving sitting at a light just like i was and then taking off throttle response just the transition everything is so clean and smooth but for the most part so far this thing is idle smooth runs good so i'm gonna find this little road i know over here it's very very low traffic we're gonna do a couple of wide open throttle punches and see if that needs to be adjusted 
adjusted. I did bring a, a couple of screwdrivers to adjust that air valve secondary that needs to be done. That's the only thing I haven't tested so far. And I would say as far as the overall review of the carburetor, more than likely I'm going to do a part two. Not necessarily of the carburetor review, but more of once I get done with this video, I'm pretty much going to jump into installing a Petronics ignition box that I bought a few months ago. I want to install it. I'll go ahead and do a video on that. And then and after I get some more testing and driving under the under my belt on this carburetor, I'll give you what I've had to do and what my overall opinion of it is overall. So Alright, nobody behind me, nobody in front of me. Got a little country road. Country-esque type road here. We're still in the city.
So, like I said, like, subscribe, that way you can stay up to date. All right, guys, I'm gonna enjoy this beautiful Sunday at uh, Sunday morning. Go for a little cruise and just enjoy the truck. Catch you on the next one.